Hello everybody, this is Derek J. Fiedler. Welcome to the YouTube channel, welcome to the live stream. A very special edition. This is 20 years anniversary right now. Welcome everybody, Derek J. Fiedler, YouTube channel. This is being recorded live. Um, it's a very special edition, 20 years. 9-11 edition it's going to be kind of a special project i'll be doing a little bit of um, a little bit of oral history mixed with some symbolic analysis just want to make sure that levels and everything are good and then at that point we'll get started All right, here we go, guys. 9-11-2001. Where were you on 9-11-2001? Do you remember? Do you remember how it started? Been marking this day on the calendar since the beginning of the year and I, I didn't know exactly what but I knew I needed to do something I am going through a really crazy season right now but I I just I felt like I needed to do something and this is what was in my hands to do so let's let's do this live stream let's record this let's do the oral history and the symbolic analysis to the best of my ability i'll give it a shot on tuesday september 11th 2001 i was 12 years old the day started out just like any other school day put on my navy blue pants and my white button-up collared t-shirt because at that time tuesdays were chapel days at my school at Zamora Christian Academy. I started out with an alarm, one of those like annoying ones that alerts and buzzes and it was uh, the red letter or the red numbers and digital alarm clock and woke up, started the day eating breakfast uh, in my house. I remember my dad, he had this really cool uh, morning routine oh. we'll see what we can do here I'm getting uh, some error warnings do my best with the internet connection that I have Well, I'll just keep going, and if not, then I'll just record this and post it, guys. I remember my dad having this... Actually, you know what? I'm going to start recording on this end. If this doesn't make it, then I'll have a backup, and I'll just post that. I'm doing what I can out here out in the country with the internet. On 9-11, I remember waking up, going into the kitchen. My dad had this radio on to Hot Talk 560 KSFO with Melanie Morgan and Lee Rogers. It was his morning routine. He would listen to the radio, and he would eat his bowl of oatmeal with uh, two pieces of toast, one for peanut butter, one for jam. Uh, I ate my bowl of cereal, and breaking news came out and they stopped their talk show they started talking about destruction and towers and i remember just like i was looking towards this like alien head shaped boom box on the kitchen table and really just looking past it just having the most oddest feeling in the world here I went from starting out my day with, you know, putting on my school uniform, navy pants and white button-up shirt, 
and then I it felt like the most uncanny feeling kind of like the feeling that you would get whenever you all of a sudden you see your car missing or you see a robber in the house and the displacement the shift is so great you you don't know how to respond I was 12 years old so I still had somewhat of a young mind I I remember the Twin Towers but only from things like movies or I remember this TV commercial where someone was trying to think of something and he was startled somehow and he looked up and he saw a skyscraper but then he had double vision and then he saw this image of the Twin Towers and I have no idea what it's for but you know I remember that as a young boy and this is radio so they're trying to orally describe um, like a verbal imagery of what's happening and how to just like they didn't know what to think because it happened so suddenly and the chaos was really coming through the airwaves we turned on the TV and then we saw the images we saw smoke we saw flames coming from the top of this building. I remember thinking that it looked like some vertical cigar or something. But it wasn't. I remember looking at the images and thinking to myself, how is this happening? Why is this happening? What are we going to do? It was those questions mixed with like a thousand other thoughts that just had me, it felt like I was on my heels, like I was about to fall over. I just couldn't stand upright. It was during school that we started hearing rumors that another plane hit and then we're like, man, and my dad remembers, uh, it's great, I, I was having a discussion last night with my dad about this. I almost wish I could bring him in and include him. He's a wise, well-articulate, very private man, though. But I'll do my best to share what he told me as well, just to kind of help round off my, my young perspective on all, all of this. So he, he had reminded me that he remembers hearing the words we don't know if this is an accident we don't we don't know what's going on everybody assumed that it was just some fatal horrible unfortunate error that led to the death of so many people then another plane hit and the whole message just totally changed and we're like we are under attack and i remember being at school thinking like what in the world are we gonna do and then more like just it just felt like everything was coming at me so fast the pentagon was the next alert and that people were saying yeah they're saying that it's tied and it's all connected and they said like this random plane like just struck the ground in pennsylvania they weren't sure if that was connected it was like a million things all at once and i had no idea what to do i didn't know how to respond Sometimes I would get feelings of like, ah, oh, that's, you know, over there. Here I am in Lower Lake, California. It's all the way over there in New York City. That's happening for over there. We're okay over here. And then there would be moments of panic. Like, I remember my, my sister, Michaela, saying, this, she, she said the most amazing thing. She says, what do we do when they come here? And I think she asked my dad that, my dad and my mom. She's like, what do we do when they come here? Like, we were really terrified. We were really terrified. Startled, confused. What were we going to do? What are we going to do now? What are we going to do in the future? I remember coming home after school. I think we came home early, actually. And... We just were glued to the TV. It reminded me of being glued to the TV in a way that was like watching the Olympics. Like, 
as a young family gathering together and you know rooting on the the heroes and the the olympians with the the highest performance and the greatest physical excellence we were just glued to that yet in a similar way we were glued to our tvs to watch the towers what do we you know what do we even do with that how do we respond i remember seeing footage on the various news channels and we just would watch it over and over and over again we would watch the burning the smoke and i distinctly remember the ash the ground level footage that they were able to capture and seeing people just covered in this gray soot fog that filled up all of new york city all of the urban landscape was just coated and saturated with this talky dust fog cloud it was in their hair it was in everything it reminds me of in the sandlot the movie when whenever the the character main character comes out and he's just covered in all of the dust and the and he's like we have to come up with a better plan and he shakes everything off it looked like a bunch of those people everywhere I remember the heroism, seeing all of the first responders, hearing reports of people maybe even jumping out of the buildings and then finally seeing images of it. It's like, that was a, that was a lot for a 12-year-old to even fathom that people would have no other recourse than to just jump out of a building. Then I remember it was either later that day or in the days after that when the footage of the plane striking the building were publicized then it became realer it's like oh my goodness like the images were starting to match or to sync up with my imagination from listening to the talk radio from hearing the reports and and it the story started to to fill out. I remember as a young boy that I was really trying to learn what the towers were and what they actually did. Like, why did they build them so high and why were there so many? Why was there two of them? I barely even knew what they were before the attack. Never been to New York City. And it was this interesting thing where, like, I was reacting to something, but I was also learning about it at the same time i was learning what the the world trade center twin towers were the different you know tower one tower two one had the antenna one didn't and then there was other smaller buildings tied to it i really didn't even know what the pentagon was you know truthfully like there was this disassociation or maybe i'd seen it in books or heard about it read about it in school but it became very real and the the learning was there where I actually knew what was happening. Over the days and the weeks that followed, I continued to react and learn. And just as that dust fog settled, we started sorting out. I remember seeing that picture of the firemen finding this pole that was leaning this way and raising it up out of this rubble there's just this like i don't know how many stories tall of just rubble and steel and concrete glass and debris and amongst all of that they were able to somehow get an american flag on this pole that was like tilting yet in that moment i felt something like we're gonna clean this up we're going to respond. I remember the address that was given by the president, uh, George W. Bush. I don't remember the exact words, but I remember feeling okay, feeling just those first seeds of hope being restored, that we're not going to be okay with this. We're the leader of the free world. We're going to be okay. Because at that point, I didn't even know that this was possible as a 12 year old boy. Like I was a little bit too young to understand what the Oklahoma bombing was. 
I didn't even remember that in 93, the World Trade Centers were attacked by a car bomb in the basement. I had... So the displacement that I felt was so significant that I didn't even know what to compare it to. I didn't even know how to define it or size it up to anything else. But once I started learning and got to this point where the president said, we're going to respond, we're going to take out the terrorists, we're going to find out who did this, we're going to do everything we can to take them out. People don't do this to our country. People don't just cross our borders and hop on planes and destroy us like this. And we will not put up with terrorism. We will not put up with terror at all. We're not going to stay in this state of terror. We're going to respond and build back and go get them. I remember feeling really good about that. I remember feeling like, well, we got to do something. Uh, but as the days unfolded, turns into weeks and months later, we learned more information, more documentaries started coming out. Uh, the game plan for the war on terror was um, revealed. We started understanding more of what was going on. And we had an enemy. We had him named. And we were on our way. And at that same time, we were rebuilding the nation. A few years later go by. Um, it still felt very real. Even five years, was it felt like a very fresh event to me. I was a senior in high school and we did a trip to the East Coast. And my brave mom, she she totally went to New York City in a 15 passenger van bringing a bunch of high school kids. We stayed at a hostel and it was the craziest like torrential downpour rain. And my mom drove through Pennsylvania, through these states to get to New York. We stayed at this, this hostel, it's like, oh my gosh, like. Can I imagine doing this with high schoolers now? Like, barely. I don't know, it felt like another time. Am I old enough to say that? We visited Ground Zero. At that point, they had cleared up the debris, and what was left were these pits surrounded by fences and a memorial listing names, it had flowers, it had symbols, items, pictures. I remember just the whole fence being lined with people and we're all like holding up against these bars and just staring into these pits. I think they were just dirt and there's still like tractors going around. Uh, they aren't like the finished fountains that I see pictures of today. They were still in progress. We weren't quite sure I wanted them to build back. I was like, man, they should build back the towers and build them taller than ever before. So whenever I saw plans of the Freedom Center, I was like, oh, what's this? What is this? I remember seeing the lights um, and feeling very hopeful too. Like, oh, there's the two, the two lights, the two pillars in the city. Uh, if you guys are just joining us, I'm kind of going through the oral history reflecting on 2001 9-11 on this 20 years later 9-11 2021 uh, once i get through my oral history we'll have a little intermission and then we'll go to more of like the symbolic interpretation of the events that unfolded and maybe do a little bit of reflection on where we're at today and how does it compare so on my senior trip i remember seeing these dirt pits and just thinking how deep they were very glad that they cleaned up the debris, wondering what we're going to be building back. Years go by and they unveil the designs for the Freedom Center. I got over the fact that it was one tower, not two, and that it wasn't as tall as I'd like it to be. Still, I was glad that we were building back. Felt very good for New York. I remember walking through New York and the people impressed me. We were going through the subway and parts of it were closed because of how rainy it was and it was flooding. But then I remember these New Yorkers with blueberry smart, blueberry, blackberry smartphones. Oh, that was bad. Uh, this was 2006, pre-iPhone, which was 2007. So I remember this guy, business suit, nice shoes, the whole bit. And he was walking around the city, which was kind of a 
foreign thing, a new thing with like the phone, you know, in the face. He was checking email, which is like a huge new thing at the time. And he stopped and he spent like 15 minutes just explaining where to go, what to do, how to navigate, how to get where um, from our hostel uh, to ground zero and then what we were doing afterwards. I remember those type of interactions happening over and over again. I remember my mom heckling people to lower their prices on the souvenirs of the places nearby Ground Zero here in 2006, my senior year trip. I remember we got like these uh, glass containers or glass paperweights where you could put like a light and it would show the Twin Towers. And I forget, all. I think we got glasses there, sunglasses, Oakleys that were fake. So like $20 Oakleys. Oakleys or whatever they call them. Very fond experience of being in New York, especially going to Ground Zero. It had a spiritual sense to it. It was an experience that was at the soul level. Don't remember any of our friends talking when we were at Ground Zero in 2006. It was like we were there for maybe an hour just looking, processing, remembering the day, remembering what it was like, thinking about what's going to happen in the future, thinking about the war that had been going on for five years at the time, wondering if we were ever going to catch bin Laden uh, to close out this quest to find the bad guy and make him pay, you know, to order, to return the peace or the, the at least the assurance of hope in this citizenry. I remember about that time, you know, being old enough, coming of age, there was a lot of other things coming out at the time. People were trying to process like the how, how do we figure out what happened here? More of like a materialistic scientific way. Like even on YouTube, I was just looking and like still the top videos with millions of views are like, how aluminum in, from the planes mixed with the steel in the building or how the, the force of the plane could do it. I remember the conspiracy theories coming out or whatever you'd like to call them, the theories that presented the idea that, or the argument that it was planned, that it was actually demolition, that there were explosive and detonators, and that it was way more preconceived than we were led to believe. Didn't know what to think about it then. Haven't looked too much into it now. But I remember, I want to get into it, but I remember that being the processing of my mind five years later, eight years later, 10 years later, at the 10 year anniversary thinking, I don't want this to slip. I don't want to be moving along with my life and this thing getting smaller and smaller in the rear view mirror as I drive forward. I want it to still mean something. I want it to be something that I remembered. I want to remember the lives. I want to remember the, the people that lost their life, the family members who had to make this huge adjustment immediately. The ones that got the news that their family members didn't make it. The image of the falling man. Gosh, I wish I never took that picture. I wish I never saw that. Images of people just falling to their death like great who wants that picture lodged up in here i didn't want to forget i wanted to remember i wanted to keep it at the forefront of who i was and what i was doing 10 years later i wanted things to be resolved and i i forget when it was um that we actually got bin Laden and the hoorah and it felt good but yet we lingered on the war that was a bit confusing it's like well if we got them then what are we doing and they're coming out with like oh well the best defense is a good offense and it's like well we haven't been attacked since that's good you know i'm getting older i'm starting to process more of like geopolitics and war and military strategy uh foreign affairs those type of things i remember immigration being a huge issue back then because people just found a way to get into our country, infiltrate with the sole intent of bringing us down and killing people. I'm, that was upsetting to me. 
and it kind of woke me up to like the whole issue of like well what are borders and what are they there for and how can we define our space here and hold true to the values that we hold dear and we agree are all important life liberty the pursuit of happiness the right to free speech the right to live with freedom and the right to govern and to live the life that we intend to have freedom of religion the list goes on it's like those things are important and we want to make sure that people coming in can at least appreciate that or participate as a part of that identity there's a reason i'm mentioning that because i'll bring it up in, in part two in the symbolic interpretation All right, so let me check here. 10 years. So we're at the 10 year mark. At that point, I'm 22. It started to fade. You know, all of a sudden, it'd be like, oh my goodness, it's 9 10. Like, oh wow, it's time to, you know, look at the pictures and remember the 9 11 and remember everything that's important and uh, turn on the TV or pull up at the time YouTube was a thing. Uh, <laughs> just starting out really and just watching clips and watching more of like the documentaries on the history channel or even like you know who would cover it like nbc abc would do their specials i never did watch the nicholas cage movie not the biggest nicholas cage fan or i didn't want to see like the fictional representation or representation of something that was so real to me so I appreciated like the footage that would come out. I remember watching a documentary, I think on VHS. I have to ask my dad if he still has it, but it was this the most interesting, fortunate circumstances that happened with someone who was just doing this simple, what is it like to be a new fireman documentary? And so we followed around with his camcorder, uh, stayed in the station uh, in new york and just followed around this team you know oh he's training oh he's responding to his first fire oh he's getting hazed or whatever and then all of a sudden the call and now he has this camera in his hand 9 11 2001 and all of this footage i i went back to those for reference um probably because that's how i remembered it that's how i wanted to so sorry, no Nicolas Cage movie. Maybe you could let me know how it went. If you'd recommend it even today. If you're like, no, just pass. Just, <laughs> just watch the documentaries. But then after that, there was a few 9-11s where I skipped it. In 2015, so that would be 14 years later, we had a natural disaster locally here in Lake County called the Valley Fire. And it was the first mega fire of its kind in our area. We've had about one or two in the area every year since then. So about six years now. But that one was another catastrophic event. It felt apocalyptic. It felt like the end of the world. The skies were scorched with smoke and this glowing, lingering emblem of fire and destruction. Uh, lots of loss, lots of ash very similar to 9-11, brought up a lot of that trauma, a lot of those memories of images and experience were now tangible. Now I had ash all over me. Now my car was filled with ash. And now I was driving around and seeing just skeletons of melted aluminum and vehicles and trailers, buildings collapsed and just obliterated to the ground. It looked like ground zero in New York City, everywhere at a residential level. I remember then, in 2015, having this camaraderie, even though it was 14 years before, thinking back to, oh, those New Yorkers, the New Yorkers that I saw on TV that felt so far away, now it feels like it's here and I'm living it and I'm with them transcended those 14 years and it was like I was there with them I remember thinking that like 
I remember having those thoughts in 2015 of like, this is, it, this must have been what they felt, what I'm feeling now. That happened on the 12th. I remember no, on September 11th, 2015, going to Reading to visit family and we didn't watch anything. We didn't do anything. I was on a road trip with what would be my wife and her sister in my 1972 Datsun wagon. Uh, yeah, my 510 is my first car. Um, and it was just fun to do that road trip, but thinking that day, like, gosh, we forgot about 9-11. 14 years has gone by. You know, it was like starting to fade. So then the next day, September 12th, the Valley Fire, the chaos, it was like, it just came right back. 14 years, just, it was right here. In the years after that, it was interesting to have these two anniversaries right next to each other. So we had 9-11. <laughs> so all of the images and remembering that at this like national crisis. And then the next day, having to remember <laughs> this very fresh, recent local disaster on the 12th. So back to back days. Maybe I should do a video tomorrow. You know, if the live stream will work, if I get enough internet or I don't know. We'll s <laughs> All I know is that I got to do something. That's just what I have deep down. Two thousand seventeen, eighteen, nineteen come and it's still fading. I, it was like fires were going on locally usually and just wasn't at the forefront so you say okay well why this year Derek how come you didn't do one last year you had a YouTube channel then I, to be honest I, I don't even think I thought about it maybe a little but it didn't happen uh, let's see After that, I decided this year to do it. So why? 20 years. It's a round number. It's a milestone numerically. I feel not just because of the anniversary aspect, but also the state of our nation right now. It feels a lot like 9-11-2001. There's a lot of parallels, and I'll get to that in part three. The thing that I didn't see or didn't read about, didn't watch, is, how would you say it, the, the deeper meaning of what the significance of the towers being struck the towers being on fire and the towers crumbling and collapsing. And what that meant to then respond by going out and to the edge of the world, the other side of the world, furthest part, furthest point from our nation to go chase the people that attacked us. I saw a lot of those like, oh, like I mentioned before, the this is the the structural design of the building this is the computer graphic recreation of what it was like to have it hit the building and re-simulation but it was never like this is why this is happening this is why so i have a lot of those unsettled analysis unsatisfied hunger to know why did this happen uh, I think I remember my grandpa who's a pastor of the church I grew up in and some other like TV preachers say like trying to tie it to like end times eschatology this is the end of the world 
This is the Christian story of how things lead to the end of the world. It has to do with prophecy. I think I remember all sorts of different interpretations of, but it was all material. It was, it, it didn't seem like it was profound enough for me to lock into or to satisfy, or to heal those wounds and to satisfy what I was really looking for. So we'll get into that with part two. Uh, let me just check in here with my workflowy notes. All right, so let's just take a little intermission. So while I kind of like change gears, go from like the historical part to the symbolic interpretation, deeper meaning stuff. Okay, so remember, this is a YouTube channel. So some kind YouTube etiquette is to subscribe. So that way you don't miss uh, announcements and updates whenever new content, new videos is being published. It also helps out with the channel as far as uh, getting the word out, letting people know. Uh, it lets the algorithm of YouTube know as well that it's time to tell more people about it, that other people might benefit from this and find value in this content. Uh, liking the video is really helpful. I'm sorry, my dashboard in the live is not where it should be, so I don't know how, how many likes we are. Um, that helps as well. Leaving a comment if you have anything, any questions, any further insights. I'd love to hear where were you on 9-11-2001? What was your experience like? Feel free to write that out and post it. Like This is a healing process for me, and I open that up and invite you to be a part of that as well. If you want, um, I'm also, I, I, I need to do a better job with announcements, but in January 2021, I started an every other week publication of a newsletter that's been a lot of fun to write. It gives you deeper insights, reflections, kind of more behind the scenes, making of art. I even share like helpful tools um, when it comes to making art or creating content. So you can find that in the description below. I'll put a link to it. I also have some fun upcoming conversations with Gareth Boyd, who I just published our conversation, uh, as well as David. Gareth is a soldier. He went to Iraq and did a tour uh, in, in the US military. And David was a part of the Canadian military. He still is today. And he served over in Afghanistan. So really interesting talking with those guys, hearing their perspectives. I'm interested to see what unfolds. They're also both writers with a Symbolic World blog, so they can bring that frame to the discussion as well. So look forward to that. Okay. The World Trade Centers. The World Trade Centers were located at the center of New York City. They could be seen from miles. They could be seen from the sea. They could be seen from land, from all around. They were the tallest buildings in the city. But they weren't just at the center geographically of the city. They were also at the center of the nation. They were icons in that they were symbols of meaning. The World Trade Center Twin Towers were in films. They were in images of propaganda, positive propaganda of this is who we are. This is something that identifies the United States. It was a symbol that had meaning of many things. One was that it was a symbol of commerce. This is where we come to enter into the economy and commerce. It was the a symbol of capitalism and the free trade. I think the World Trade Center. Like, so it was the not just the center, but it was also the pillars. Now, what do the pillars mean? 
It's interesting that they didn't just have one at the time, that they decided to build two. Now there's a few books I want to refer to. Uh, one, of course, you all know it. Um, and if you don't, I have a three-part review of the language of creation in the YouTube channel. My favorite is especially episode two. So uh, if you're going to watch it, make sure to watch at least to episode two. It's just like Star Wars with uh, Empire Strike Back. Uh, the other one is Through New Eyes has an excellent section on trees and towers and pillars and explaining what they mean and what they mean, not just like in a physical sense, but what they symbolize and the meaning that they embody and the place that they have in the greater world or the greater cosmos that we live. So <sighs> towers are the things that uphold meaning and matter. So they maintain order by separating the opposites. The conversation that I had with Josh Martin, where we shared the writings that you won't find in Language of Creation, they're additional unpublished writings, not in this one. Uh, so make sure to go to that video. I posted uh, uh, Google Doc that you can download, that you can read of uh, Matthew's additional insights where he has, uh, you know how he does it, this amazing, dense, compact, trim, tight, one page way of explaining just an incredible amount of explanation. So he was saying that pillars are the things that uphold heaven and earth. They're the things that hold the opposites at bay. They're the things that allow us to have nuance of meaning, and they're the things that maintain identity. So it's not just that these buildings were where people went to engage in commerce. They were the symbols of the free world and capitalism. <laughs> they were also the identity of the nation. They were the icons of the principles that we have as far as free commerce, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. When we, when we look at the towers, when we see pictures of them, that's what we think about. When the towers fall, it's a collapse of heaven and earth. It's a collapse of heaven and earth, and it's entering into the chaos of waters or just loose matter, just chaotic potential. Think about it like making a fort. I love, love making forts with my daughter and my son on the weekends. It's our special Friday night, Saturday morning activity. We make forts, try to make a new one all the time. We get sheets, we use the couch, but what upholds the fort is the pillar usually like a you know broomstick type of thing some type of upright pillar that holds up the fort what happens when you take that away you remove the pillar the sheet collapses and it loses its identity as a fort and there's this panic of like my daughter is the classic example oh no dad oh no the fort fix it fix it fix it so too, with the collapse of the pillars of the World Trade Center Twin Towers. Whenever they collapsed, so too did the identity. There were no longer towers. The pillars were gone. What happens when that, what, what, how would you say, like soul response? do we have whenever the pillars are collapsed, whenever we lose that identity, when the meaning that upholds order is gone in an instant. We enter into the chaotic waters of confusion. We don't know what is good, what is bad, who's the bad guy, what is true, what's not. There's a confusion of facts and false reports. We don't know where to direct our purpose and our meaning. So that's why it was important to erect the tower, erect that pillar. 
that just it didn't just happen years later whenever they finally cleared that debris and began building the freedom tower it happened whenever the president right who of course is if you look at the pillar of the nation that we call the united states he's the top so he's the one that has to restore the pillar or the cosmic mountain those two similars are they're very similar in their function in, in the world he has to restore the order of the the mountain of the united states of america and by doing that he needs to erect the pillar to do that he has to redirect the purpose so that way we can build back from this ground level confusion the you could call it the ash of uncertainty and chaos now we have a little bit of purpose we're going to go get the bad guys we're going to clean this mess up next we're going to build back so now we have a plan that's already even before we physically do it reconstructing the spirit of the nation the zeitgeist if you want to call it that but the identity is being liberated from the confusion and the chaos and we're building back that order this is all happening at the symbolic level this is not like before we even mess with debris or construction materials we were building back through identity and purpose and of course those things are intangible so they're heavenly in the christian way of expressing it okay let me i want to share my outline with workflow i hope you guys can see that it's kind of keeping me on track i want to do this like in a paul vanderclay style where if you're familiar with him he does these rough drafts where this is all this isn't like a, an essay that i'm submitting to the symbolic world i'm not reading a script i'm verbally processing here in a cathartic way where I'm, I'm trying to do this in a way that's healing wounds and traumas and provide something more substantial and profound than just like explaining the material re-simulation of planes hitting skyscrapers why two towers why why two what does that represent there's some other t places that we see this. this is actually an old ancient symbolic pairing i mean even the catholic church dos torres they i remember all throughout latin america when i was traveling on my bicycle we would stop at the center of the pueblos the center of the the cities and they would have the courtyard with the government buildings the commerce and on one side of the area it was the two towers of the catholic cathedral i think of samson as well old old story older than we know samson of course i'm thinking of the image where he is at the lowest point and he is his hair is cut he's lost his strength he disobeyed the lord the anointing of supernatural strength and his uh, calling as a judge is seemingly gone but then he repented and he came back to this place where he regained his strength so long enough that he could self-sacrifice in order to put his right hand and his left hand against two pillars of the foreign nation, right? That erected this false mountain, this Tower of Babel, you could call it. And he pushed those two pillars down and the whole edifice the empire came down with it not just the material marble or whatever they built that temple out of but the whole thing came crashing down it crushed the leaders and israel was allowed to rebuild its nation according to new towers a new principle over the course of the years the panic and the chaos subsided and we started building back and then uh, later the physical symbolic representations were restored i think also of 
when they remember 9-11, you'll see the images of the beacons of light coming from ground zero. The beacons of light. So you see these two lights, and I just love that. that whoever did that, bravo. That was an excellent call because, you know, what does light bring us all? It brings, uh, under, it's, it's a heavenly symbol of glorification. It reflects the sun. It reflects that which is above us. And the energy, the source of life, is being glorified through these beacons of light. So we think of that. That What does that bring? That brings a soul hope. It brings the spirit upliftment. Like, oh, we can look here, not at the rubble, not at the craziness going on, or yeah, it's not the construction project isn't complete yet. It gets us looking above that towards... The sun towards the heavens towards the glory of, of hope of the future it kind of like this tell us like gosh jp and how would you call it the miracles trio john verveke and uh paul vanderclay jp marceau had uh miracles part the third <laughs> to refer to gareth um and they talked all about teleology or the end or the being in being in the pre uh, informing the present with the end in mind or like you know uh of course seven habits for effective people it's begin with the end in mind so it gets us beyond the present and thinking of the hope of the future of when we will have these the towers restored not just the physical building but the identity of the nation the hierarchy and i'm talking this in a positive way well hmm. the potential for reinstituting and reconstructing reordering the nation upon the purity of the original seed or the original design of the rest of the mountain so we can rematerialize the mountain based on the revelation of the founding of the nation upon those principles that the pillars provide. Pillars are also very important in building the cosmic house, which again, language of creation has this awesome section on of that it's important to separate heaven and earth. Refer to that for more detail. I'm going to move on. Let's get back to the center. So I talked about it being ground zero as the center of things that happen. The center, if you were to look at, say, a dot and a circle, you look at, it's the same view as if you were to get into an airplane, fly over a mountain, you'd look down, you'd see the pinnacle, the top of the mountain, and the base. It's a dot and a circle. It's a two-dimensional uh, view, bird's eye view of a mountain, the epicenter. So it's not just that there's this pillar at ground zero. If we were to like fly up, we'd look down at the Twin Towers or now the Freedom Center, we'd see the center surround, and then we'd see the surrounding city and the rest of the nation. Okay, what it, what, what's the point in all of that? It's also a mountain. Pillars, like I said, pillars and mountains are very closely related in their symbolic meaning and how they unfold. A mountain is the thing that has the principle, say the, the pattern that is repeated and carried out throughout the remainder of the mountain, like a fractal. You could look at that also in governance. It's the things that has the principles, the laws, the morals, the very organizing principles that get played out in law in congress in governance in the lives of everyday people at the the, the multitude at the, the bottom of the mountain to refer to mount sinai so it's restructuring and unifying the whole nation or the mountain of the united states of america i also want to bring in the element of the foreigner the foreigner is really important I think that's enough with workflow. Bye bye, workflow. Okay, so the foreigner. Oh, I wasn't showing you workflow. Never mind. 
<laughs> Sorry, I'm still getting my skills, my chops here. Uh, PVK, you are the pro. Uh, but hey, this is drafting style. I'm learning as I go along. Any suggestions, I am welcome to it. I'm not the tech guy. I, I really love the content, and I want to focus on bringing you guys the best content possible. So anything on the technical side that you could help with, that would be awesome. Okay, so here's my workflowy list. This is how I organize my brain. Uh, I was just running and referring back to the outline of jotting down the thoughts that I had as far as points that I don't want to pass over while I'm verbally processing. So one of the last points in this part two, this talk of the symbolic interpretation of what's happening is the, the idea of the center and the margin or the citizen and the foreigner. The foreigner from the other side of the world came to the United States to the very center of commerce, to the pillars of our nation and tore it down. We responded by then leaving the center or the capital city, if you will, the top of the mountain, going down the mountain to the base, to the fringes of where does the forest begin and where does the mountain end? We're not quite sure. And then we left that. Now we're in the wild wood, the foreign territory, the place of unknown people and lands and terrain. We go there and we try to hunt down the enemy to take him out, to make him pay for what he did and what this group did to us. We stretch our resources thin as well. So it's like you have to take resources from the city and then go all the way out to the fringes of war at, in foreign lands. So at the same time, we need to like sure up and make sure that we protect the mountaintop and the mountain of the nation without you know, compromising that security for pursuit of the enemy. Reminds me of uh, stories in, uh, again, some of the older stories from the Bible, like in 1 Samuel, of pursuing the enemy and getting too greedy, going too far out into the foreign margins of the world. Spend, spending too much resources and then key leaders dying and then you leave the center of the mountaintop and the rest of the mountain vulnerable for a further attack. So here we are, we're fighting this war out in the, the wild wood of the margins and then back home, we're trying to rebuild the pillars. So it's interesting. That's really the state that we've been in the last 20 years. That brings me to the very last closing reflections because I, I want to leave it there. Oh, mm -hmm. Do I? I had a few parts of these books that I wanted to read. Let me just open it up and see if it's appropriate. Sure, I'll go ahead and read a paragraph from Language of Creation. The tree or the pillar is a symbol of the spatial axis, a center, a central pillar that upholds the integrity of space, that is the ordered built world, by separating above from below, north from south, east from west. Another important symbol of the spatial axis is the cosmic mountain, which embodies stability in the natural world stands at the center of the universe in resistance to the forces of pointless change that constantly threaten to flood the land. I'm starting to feel that unsettledness right now as a citizen of the United States of America 2021 9-11 today while recording this I'm just trying to explain where I'm at I'm not I'm not making any accusations this is just to help with the healing process there's a question of the stability of the mountain that holds the identity and the livelihoods of the nation as we know it 
the ordering principle or the king of this nation is not responding in the same way that we did 20 years ago. The interesting thing is that we're not being attacked at the center, at least not in an obvious way, like a terrorist attack. Now, just like my sister experienced terror by like, what happens when they come to us, daddy? That's exactly what they want. That's exactly what terrorism is all about, is striking fear and trying to mechanize that fear to get people to do what you want them to do. That's what terrorism does. We're not responding to an attack that happened in New York City. We're responding. There's been an attack in the wild wood of the margins, uh, the furthest reaches of the kingdom or the country of the U.S. How are we responding to that? And it's almost like we're making friends with the enemy, like we're elevating the foreigner higher than it ought to where it's becoming this principle that is replacing the other ordering principles, becoming kind of like a false tower of Babel. It's like an idol. And so instead of saying, listen, either you integrate to our ordering principles or we're kicking you off the mountain, so to speak, we're not doing that like we did in 2001. What are we doing? Like, and I hope to get into much more detail with the conversation with Gareth and David about all of this. But the attack happened. 13 of our citizens, military servicemen and women, died. Very similar to the way that 9-11 happening and how those events unfolded. But again, the location is different and like the symbolic geography matters where, what are we gonna do? We sent our resources over there. We're trying to pull back. We didn't do the best job that we could have. Um, it left us vulnerable and now we're be they're able to poke at our vulnerability because we're stretched too thin from we're stretched from the mountain to the wild wood at the margins and now the chaos is starting to come because we don't have the borders or the the margins uh, beyond the mountain shored up nor do we have the mountain or the homeland shored up it's not ordered correctly there's chaos there's confusion there's fear there's an interesting subtle domestic terrorism happening in the classical sense of the word of mechanizing fear and terror uh, to get what you want rather than voting on it and legislating it and talking about it freely amongst the citizenry amongst the leaders and coming to consensus uh, democracy I think they, they call it, and uh, uh, republic by which we stand. So it's almost like the identity at the margins is like creeping its way back to the homeland, the, the center of our where we reside. And it's bringing its identity, its ordering principles with it. We're starting to act and see more of the enemy that we've been fighting for 20 years carried out here amongst the citizenry y'all watch the sci-fi movie oh what is it um project 49 it's the movie where the aliens go to south africa johannesburg and they kind of look like these cricket aliens that is a good movie to help understand symbolically of where we are at today because if you see, there's people that go out to the edges where the foreigners are, and this is like archetypal alien foreigners, like you can't get more foreign than someone outside of the planet, this being come um, to our planet. And then they're bringing their way of life, their identity, and you see it carried out in this anatomical way where the, 
the, one of the main characters gets infected, scratch bitten, something like that, and then begins slowly integrating the identity, the anatomical formation of the alien. And then at the end of the movie, you see he's now not human. He's fully integrated as whatever cricket aliens they were calling them. So we're somewhere in the in the middle there where I'm starting to see patterns over here in Iraq and Afghanistan where we were at the fringes of the our world, the United States world. It's almost like we created this bridge. We created a bridge that brought it back. I don't know how it happened. I don't I don't want to begin to explain. I'm trying to figure it out where we're at, especially at a more profound found symbolic way so we're starting to see terror and fear as a mechanism we're starting to see more of the behaviors of the enemy that we've been fighting for 20 years here at home so now we have this tug of war and i love how pusho says it in the same chapter that i was reading from before how he calls it a cosmic eternal tug of war between trying to erect the pillar and of the mountain and then the chaotic randomness of potential trying to tear it down and bring it back into the floodwaters and the confusions of the opposites you don't know what's up and down it's all just waves going in all different directions this is the way that Machu Peugeot says it by the way, Matthew Peugeot, if you're listening, I so appreciate your comment in the last podcast with Gareth. Made my year, made my day. Thank you for the work that you've done. Um, we just appreciate every single contribution you make to this interesting community of symbolic thinkers in this a corner of the internet that is somehow strung together from people located all over the world wish and pray the best for you and your family here we go in ancient cosmology space and time are engaged in a constant battle over manifestation or integration is the word i was using to explain this the cycle or wave swallows space and overturns the earth while the spatial axis splits the waters and founds the earth or the nation you could say in general, there is a constant tug of war between the dominion of cyclical time and the dominion of spatial stability, or the chaos of confusion, purposelessness, lack of identity, with the dominion of building out a city and governing a nation of people according to central principles. There's a different spirit today. As I talked about before in the historical part of this talk, this verbal process, there's a. I distinctly remember the hoorah spirit. It's like, we're going to get the bad guy, we're going to rebuild, we're going to be stronger than ever before. After the attacks in Afghanistan and the loss of life and the deeply tragic sorrow that is still going on right now especially for the families and the friends and the fellow servicemen and women of the ones that lost their lives um i i don't have any hoorah left i i don't i don't have any right now i am feeling more of the chaotic waters of confusion of like what are our real principles what are we doing like who are we the things that i grew up and knew to be important they are being trashed right now the principles that upheld you know the towers of our nation it's kind of like they're half built and half torn apart that was matthew was talking about it'd be like starting the freedom tower and then like leaving it half constructed and then the builders and the city and all of the players and the actors that go on 
in deciding whether it should be built or not are arguing and some want to tear it down and just return it back to its raw materials and others want to lift it up and construct it according to the design of the architectural principles laid out that's where i think we are we're in this half construction process and i don't know if we're going to demolish the whole thing or if we're going to reconstruct it and finish the work and rebuild the towers. The big question I have and the one I want to leave you with is when the towers fall, how do we respond? We know how we responded in 2001. How are we going to respond in 2021? How are we going to respond? I think that's about all I have to say on that topic. The only other one I want to bring is that I don't want to just bring my experience alone because there is an important familial line or descent that comes as well where my grandpa and grandma i was so blessed to spend all this time talking about this stuff with grandpa who served in world war ii in the navy guadalcanal he remembers pearl harbor my grandma remembers pearl harbor he remembers the hoorah all out where the whole nation was unified under one purpose and it was clear we responded to an enemy with a name. We knew where they were. We were going to go get them. And we are going to restore order and build back what was destroyed. He got to be a part of that. I got to be part of, in a similar way, 9-11 in, in 2001. My grandma even remembers. They were, the whole nation was so unified under these principles and this identity that she remembers knitting together blankets and scarves that she handed I believe she said to the Red Cross or to some agency like that, that would take them to the hospitals and to the soldiers and overseas. Like we were taking the materials of the nation and lifting them up for the purpose of fighting this fight. And we're all in it together, even to the lowest parts of the United States kingdom or the nation, the mountain. It's a beautiful picture. Um, I'm looking around, I don't see people knitting sweaters or blankets. I'm not seeing people like my grandpa going out in mass and finding a way to sign up for the Navy when they're 17 and doing whatever they had to get past any hindrances like him being practically blind uh, to go serve and to lay down their life for the good of the cause, for the identity that they uphold. I want to bring it also back to Samson. Samson is a very similar story, but the actors are, uh, changed and shifted away. The two towers that he pushed and fell that collapsed on him in his act of self-sacrifice, that was the enemy's camp. That was their kingdom that he destroyed or disintegrated. And he was taking out their ordering principle and scattering their people they didn't have a king they didn't have something to unify them they lost their identity which allowed the israelites to rebuild their nation i want to see us i don't want us to rebuild because I don't think we've deconstructed to that point. But I do want to see how we can uphold. How can we maintain and keep the pillars erected? The interesting thing is that this, this scales, right? So it's not just the national level. We see this at the community level too. We could see the breakdown of a community where it loses its purpose. But then it also goes to the individual level where the things that are important at the national level, they get lived out throughout the 
remainder of the mountain below. And it's almost like they get lived out throughout all of the individuals making the base or the, the body of the mountain. And then it's directed and organized with the tip. The, it's, it's really, really important that the body carries out the principles of the pinnacle of the mountain or the leaders. We need to live it out, y'all. And these these things, like what we care about, about the United States, about freedom, liberty, fighting for what is right, being a kind and caring, but not a pushover country. That's really important. That's not going to be some symbolic thing that gets upheld just at the legislature alone, let's say. It's something that has to be carried out throughout, up and down, and to the furthest extent of this national mountain. It, it's upheld by us. So when the towers fall, they get built back up by us. We need to do our part. I need to do my part. I need to do my part with maintaining the principles of liberty, the pursuit of happiness, of the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, religious liberty, religious convictions, of my faith, of Christianity, of the, f the frame of Christianity that allowed the art even the articulation of our founding documents and principles therein. It needs to get lived out. I'm thinking about my work situation, about my family, about my local community. How can I be a leader? How can I be a pillar that people can look to to maintain order <laughs> whenever there's chaos all around or whenever the floodwaters are just trying to take back that mountain and bring the city back into the sea? Will I be someone that stands like a pillar for people to lean on and to pick themselves back up so they can stand as well? Where were you on 9-11, 2001? Where are we at today? And how are we going to move forward? Thank you for your time and attention. That's all for now. I look forward to further conversations. And gosh, I really value your, your readership as well as your viewership uh, and your support. The encouragements have been really, really amazing as of late. And I can't thank you more. It's lighting a fire, rekindling me to continue the work that I'm doing here on YouTube. Okay. God bless America.